Hello guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome to the Geek Group. In today's equipment autopsy, I promised you Daisy Wheel. After the dot matrix thing, we did a dot matrix printer, I promised you Daisy Wheel. So today we have Hermes because Messenger, get it? It's a typewriter, Hermes. Okay, so we get to take this apart and most of this is pretty dumb. But the cool part we want to learn about is the daisy wheel setup. So that's really what the focus is going to be. All the rest of this is just the hard candy shell that's going to get us to the chocolatey goodness of the daisy wheel. So we don't really care about the rest. So I'm just going to blast through a lot of this. Um, let's see if it works. Maybe it does stuff. Oh, it has the dumbest plug ever. Oh, oh, it's doing stuff. All right, now will it do stuff if I take its cover off? Will you, will you come out? You want to come out. You, you know you want to come out. Delicate precision touch. Okay, so we've got the roller here, and we've got this roller, which you don't really need this roller either. We, we don't need that. Okay. There, now we're, we're right down in there. Cool. All right, so we've, this is the ink ribbon. Oh, wow. We'll explore the ink ribbon in a minute, but it's going to be kind of funny. So the daisy wheel is this part right here. This It's kind of... Kind of hard to see, but the daisy wheel is this bit right here, which actually has bits of white out stuck to it. But you can see the little petals here. That's the daisy wheel. So watch in there, and when I type C, it's really hard to do this upside down. When I type C, you can see this jumps up, spins around to find the pedal C, and then punches it forward. But it doesn't. Is that actually typing? All right, I'm going to turn this around so that I can type. And we'll put a convenient piece of paper into it, because you can totally load paper towels into a printer that's, or into a typewriter. That's a great idea. What's the worst that could happen? All right, so, oh, it doesn't auto-repeat, so I'm just going to back it up. All right, so you can see the daisy wheel right here, these little petals down lower, the daisy wheel, and I just tossed a paper towel in here because that's what we had sitting handy, but as I type, you can see it spins around. and goes in, does its thing, we'll, we'll back up. It doesn't have an auto-repeat, which is making me kind of crazy. But hey, it's typing. All right, so we bring this out, and it actually types. OK, you can see, look, Chris Bowden, the geek group. I'm original. All right, so let's talk about how that works. This is an impression type printer. What it's doing is we have the ink ribbon, and this is just a plastic, it's a piece of tape. Think of it like a piece of scotch tape. And on, on the back side out here, it has ink. And from the front side, when you smash through, it smushes the ink into whatever you want to print on. So if you grab your convenient piece of paper of science, our paper towel of science, get rid of that because we want to be presentable. 
Now, if I lay the ink ribbon like this and I push with a screwdriver, boop, like that, I get a clear spot, just like all the other ones. You can see the writing down here. And now there's a clear line there, and it makes a line on this. So if I just hold this down and draw, I can make the, the lines on there, and that's coming off here. So the ink ribbon's really, really simple. We can probably just pop this open and look inside. I've never taken one of these apart before. It probably just snaps together from the looks of it. Okay, inside we've got the drive gear that moves it along. And we have a big wheel of ink ribbon, cool, with a little spring to make sure it feeds on properly. So here's our supply reel. And our take up reel is having some problems. This wad is the take up reel. Now, here's kind of a cool thing. Since, as we saw, anything I type on there gets deposited on the thing, but it leaves a white spot on here. If you have this ribbon and you unroll it, you can read, it's going to be backwards, but you can read everything that was ever typed on this typewriter by all the previous people who have used the same ink ribbon. So this was, at one point in history, a major security breach because you could have, let's say, a bank used this, or the phone company, not that I ever spent any of my childhood in phone company dumpsters. But they would throw these away because they, they run out and they just toss it in the bin. So you'd find one of these in a dumpster. And if you had this, now you could just unroll that and do some decoding and you could get information. This is the kind of thing that makes people in the hippo world crazy. So yeah. So we're just going to throw that away. But now you can go digging through our trash and learn all kinds of cool stuff. So that's how we get it on the page. Now, how do we get the actual letter? Oh, we've got a bonus feature. Check this out. See these two yellow spools? Watch this. If I pop this off and unfeed it, it's all up in there. Okay, now this has black letters on a clear tape. This, I could be wrong, but I think I know what this is. I think this is an eraser. I think this is a way to erase, like think of it like white out, but without the white. I think this peels it off, but you would have to go back and type the exact character. Like if you, if you're going along, you type something and it's wrong, you're like, oh, I didn't mean that to be a capital G. It was supposed to be lowercase. You hit backspace, you use this, and there will be a, a clear correct or something. I don't really know how to use one of these very well. It's been a long time. But this would stamp this on there, and it would suck the ink back up. So cool. I think that's what this is. I think this is a, an erase feature, which is kind of cool on a typewriter to be able to erase something. So now we're getting into, no! Oh, it's angry at me now. What? This power button. Move that way over there. It's all better now. Yep. All right. So every time I do that, it makes it angry. You can't hit two keys at once or something. I don't know. It's kind of dumb. So, hi. And it doesn't have a repeat function. So let's move this out here. Okay. So we have, there's a motor here, and the whole thing, there's a striker. See, there's one motor that advances it forward. 
And then there's there's this motor down here that moves the daisy wheel itself. Then there's gonna be a little striker in here. So let's start digging into it. Oh wow, that makes it way easy. Look at this. If I back it up, you can see it's kind of dark down in there, but you can see the daisy wheel, which I can just lift out. So here is our daisy wheel. Now this is kind of cool. This daisy wheel is labeled 10 Orator 189. Here, I'll turn it around so you guys can see it. Okay, there's our daisy wheel. Now 10 Orator 189, that's the font. It's 10 point font, Orator. Um, this works when you press a letter, it spins around to that letter, so there'll be a little indexing like a stepper motor and goes and says you want an, a D. Okay, this one's D right here on top. And then the little, ah, hey, quit doing it. Oh, I did that. Um, when you press the D, it spins around a D, and then it, when it's in the right spot, it smacks this forward, and the little pedal of the daisy, that's why they call it a daisy wheel, smacks forward and hits the page. And it's, it's very similar to offset in that you have a raised version of the letter and it smacks into the page. Um, and if you're looking at this from the front, they're all wrong reading, like letter, or yeah, they're all wrong reading. But you spin them around like this and they're right reading, so. So it's, it's kind of a letterpress form of printing, but different. Let's see, will you? No, you won't. But if I put that up there, will you? No, you won't. Does it know it doesn't have a thing? No, it has no idea. So it doesn't know if there's no daisy wheel in it. Something that is lost in the world today is the massive racket that was once made in offices around the world by having a herd of people at typewriters. How do I get into here easily? See, I'm hoping to have just an easy way where I can pop a thing and, and the whole carriage comes right out. But I don't think that's gonna happen. So I'm going to have to dig into this. First, let's unplug it for safety. Check this out. Zoom in really, really hard. So I take the bottom off, and here's a couple things of note right away. First off, check out those batteries. That looks like one of those crystal growth experiments I had when I was a kid. Also, this is an EEPROM. This little thing right here, that's an EEPROM. See the window? Inside the window, that's the actual chip. It's like a memory chip. The problem is usually the window is covered. If you leave the window open, light can get in, and it's UV light that erases these to reset them. They're, they're referred to, a common term is EEPROM, Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. And you shine a light in there to erase it. But it's kind of cool that you can actually see the microchip inside there. And to give you an idea how tiny that is, there's my finger, my banana finger for scale. So that's kind of cool. But the batteries are just awesome. So 
don't need you. All right, so this leaves us with two main components. We have everything on the top, which is the transport and carriage and everything, which is what we want, and everything on the bottom, which we're going to take a quick moment and just give a cursory look at. We don't need you on there anymore. <laughs> on the bottom, we have power supply here. You can tell by the big filter caps and full wave bridge rectifier, rectifier, three fuses, some power silicon, voltage regulators probably. So that this whole thing here is the power supply. It's even kind of warm. Um, here's our main transformer, which our big power comes in. This steps it down to various things we need. Nothing special there. And then we've got this, which is as computer as it gets. We've got some NEC chips here. It tells us what to replace the batteries with. And you got to love those batteries with their little crystal farm there. So, yeah. And it tells us what to replace the batteries with. Olivetti part number 5400201A. There's nothing interesting here. Everything was made in Italy. A couple adjustment potentiometers here. But really, simple circuit board. This board underneath is the keyboard. And that's that. And there is a ROM here. And this says USA on it. We could probably hand this off to Kidwell who could decode it and see what's in there, which might be kind of fun. So I'll set this aside. I'll hand that off to Paul. All right, so we don't need any of this. This is boring. Let's get rid of that. OK. Here is where the simple robot is. So now I'm going to keep digging. We're halfway there. Now we're getting, oh, hey, I wonder if the chewed up, dried out rubber bands might have impacted its performance. OK. So that's advance. This is left and right. Yeah, that's left and right. It's such a smooth, clean operating machine. All right, at this phase, we are well into the guts now. And we can see the major componentry. To advance the page this way, there's a motor right here. And this moves you up and down by lines. OK, so that moves this. That's what this motor does. Now, to move the carriage assembly left and right, so to advance and retract the carriage. There's a motor down here with a gear and a cable drive. And let's see if we can get you a good look at that. Here's the motor. There's the gear. There's the drum. Here's the piece of aircraft cable. And this attaches here. It anchors to the carriage assembly with a clamp. And you can see it winds up on the drum here. If you look really close right here, you can see it. So that's how that works. Now, that covers the carriage assembly as far as its, its linear motion. Let's get into the actual head, which means i got to take a bunch more stuff apart. But I'm on my way. Give me just a moment.
but not for long. Okay. Take this out. I think that's all of them. Now we can take out, now see this acts as an impression cylinder. To, to compare this to like an offset press, this X is the impression cylinder, which is kind of cool. Yeah, I want to say maybe like a blanket cylinder. It's more like an impression cylinder. So, that doesn't attach to anything. See, I just got to see what parts will just shake off at this point because a lot of them. Okay, if you won't go off that way, you'll go off that way. Oh, I don't need you or you. I got to tell you a story about this in a minute. We'll get to that. So I can cut that and take those right off. Can't cut that though. Cut that. But I can cut that. And then it'll just come right out. Won't you? You totally will. You will because you're my real friend. If you were my real friend, you'd do it. There you go. There. Ha. Got rid of that. Now, there's one last shaft holding that on there. And they were pretty, oh no, 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 yes, yes. Can we? I think we can. I totally can. Okay, what, what holds you together? Not, not a lot. I could tweak that. Don't need that anymore. There is absolute, that whole thing moves. And the only thing holding it in there is, is that. OK. I think that's it. If I loosen this, this will move. If I loosen this, it'll move the other way. Okay. Lots of collets. But all I need it to do, there's so much gunge on it. Turn, 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 and then slide. Slide, and you'll be pretty okay. Now, oh, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. I thought I could. I wanted to. Oh, I got to take off that one. Oh, it's buried in there, too. Wait, I may have. I don't have. It was a fleeting thought, but it was a good idea. It was a really good idea right up until the moment it wasn't. All right. I can, I can push this through. Oh, yes, I can totally do that. Ah. Ah. I rule. OK, so I can get that out. And then all I got to do is take off one little nut way down in there, right, right there, one little widgy bit. And if I could get a wrench on it, that would be so awesome. I can see it, I can touch it, or I can get a wrench on it. Pick any two. So if I go to a smaller set of pliers, because it's not in there hard, come to this end where the work is, yes. Come to daddy. And now, one sixth of a turn at a time. I will slowly back this out because I can't get a finger on it. 
this is gonna suck and there's no way. No, wait, 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 wait. Can I? Can if I could see it would be so much cooler. Yes! Glory! Ha! I'm just gonna sit here a minute and be chuffed. Okay. That was not easy. Die. All right, so now we're into the carriage assembly. This is wickedly complicated for something that was designed before computers were a thing. Um, what we have is this whole thing lets us now, in use, it would sit like this, okay? So we can tip this back. It's covered in goop. We can tip this back, and that lets us change out the daisy wheel. So we won't put the new daisy wheel, and we just take the new daisy wheel, and you line it up, and it goes in down here, and then it spins around and does its thing, okay? Now with the dot matrix printer, we had the series of little needles that, and they all fire, and it worked on solenoids, right? It'd fire the solenoid, and it'd shoot the little needle ahead, and different patterns gave us different dots. With this, there's only one big needle and if I can get this part off, I can show you. So let's, let's dig into the, because there's, there's a gun in here, basically. It fires this one big rod forward. And if I can get, right, because I know it's right here. There you go, big solenoid right there. That's the solenoid that shoots the needle forward. And I might even be able to take the solenoid right out of there. And we can extract the big needle. this work. I'll bet we can even make this thing fire. All right, let's take a minute here. This is the big needle, okay, and it moves like that, and there's no markings on the solenoid at all. It's a spring return solenoid, and all this extra stuff is just for holding it in place and letting it float a little bit. It has to move around and do stuff, but and covered in schmoo. Let's take a minute here. We'll strip these, we'll strip these wires back. Now, I have no idea the voltage or anything on this, but I know it's DC. So, If it clicks and doesn't move, we got to go the other way. We're just going to give it a nice, happy 12 volts, which is up about there. It went out and didn't come back. There we go. All right, here, look. Now watch down here, and every time I touch the wires together, boop, it's out, it's in. And that's its whole world. So every time you press a key, that would jump out like that. Now I wonder, just for kicks. Let's turn the power off there. Let's give it 60 hertz. Now it might just sit there and hum. I think it's just gonna sit there and hum. 
But let's see what it does if we give it AC. Oh, that's DC. Let's go over to AC. OK, this is 60 hertz. We'll give it about the same voltage. Oh, no. If I increase the voltage, it goes out further. But what I've just done here is made a really crappy tattoo gun. You could totally see. So if you're living in D block doing, you know, 18 to life, you can get an old daisy wheel printer and gut the head for making the first part of your tattoo gun. There's your helpful hint. So that's kind of cool. That would actually work. All right, back to work. Now we've got our prison tattoo gun, at least the first part of it. I want to say a hi to all my fans in D Block at Joliet. All right, so that's how we fire the letter. Now, how do we select the letter? That's a different motor, and that is a different set of screws to take apart. So I've got to get smarter than a machine. This is not going to be easy. What does that mount to? That mounts. You know, I don't need all this extra stuff. I could just take that off. That would let me right down into its secret chocolatey goodness. Because all I want is the cream filling. Now, I know a lot of you at home are wondering, is this going to be the episode where he finally really stabs himself in the hand? Place your bets now, because it's six to five and pick him at this point. Because I'm having to do some pretty ugly things with screwdrivers to get it. It's so covered in schmoo. There's just so much schmoo. Everything's greased. It's all electromechanical. I have had cleaner teardowns of car engines. bends around there like that. And if you bend it back, it'll fit through the hole. So you just whoop. That's how they lock that in place, which is kind of dumb. See, I say it's kind of dumb, but it held it in there for 30 years. Okay. Bend that one around to fit through the hole. that piece. that piece out. 
Now we're down to the motor mount. So we just gotta take this one. Tell me there's a sideways hole you come out of. Really need to get that. Oh, that's how, okay, that's, that makes sense. You could just, the whole thing could come right through the middle. You know you want to. All the cool kids are doing it. Yes, I'm attempting to, dis to disassemble something through the use of peer pressure. There! I don't know who designed this part, but I hate you. I will find you, and I will set your lawn on fire. Okay, so now that we've gotten past the end boss, I'm just so completely covered in schmoo. Everything's greasy. It's just... It's so greasy. It's like it was designed by Italians or something. All right. So we pull that out of there. Pull this out of here. Die in a fire. Okay. Once again, my moment of chuffed. So, what we have is a motor here, but the motor looks surprisingly dumb. And I'm not entirely sure it's actually a stepper motor. Let's try something and see. Because if I if I got two main wires coming off of a set of brushes on the side of the motor, that does not say stepper motor to me. And if I put DC power on these wires and this motor starts spinning like crazy, it's not a stepper motor. Hey, I got a red wire, I got a red plug. I'll put those two together. Black and blue, because that's how I end up at the end of these. All right. Separate those for safety. Power hot. It's Chuchin. That's not a stepper motor, yo. All right, so what we can do at this point is I can line up the three things. And now our daisy wheel turns. So, this is kind of cool because this is dumber than we thought it was. That's not a stepper motor, yo. That's just a brush type DC motor. Nothing special there at all. This is really dumb. So what they have is a rotary encoder. That's this whole mess hanging on the back. That's a rotary encoder and that's feeding off data through those wires and it's telling it pretty accurately where this motor is. So it just spins around until it gets there and says, okay, turn the power off. You're no, you went a little too far. You gotta go back a little bit. And then it lets it fire. So we can set this like this. And it'll groove right along, won't it? Let's just crank that up. Yeah! Here's your high-speed daisy wheel. So, we've got the daisy wheel and its motor, and that's pretty cool. And I'm glad that we got to get all the way down in there. That thing, I want to know how they do that with just a brush DC motor, because that's, I mean, I get that there's a rotary encoder on there, but man, that had to be hard. 
So we've got this, and we've got our tattoo gun. So this would exist like that, and it'd spin it around and then push it forward. And that's how the whole thing works. And that is our in-depth exploration of a daisy wheel printer. The next one is going to be the select type or whatever it's called, the, the IBM one with the big bowl. I'm going to find one. I will find one for you, and we will take it apart because that'll be pretty cool. That thing just moves. It's surprisingly fast for such a low voltage. I'm only giving it 15 volts. I kind of want to put a propeller on the end of that. All right, you guys have fun. That's Daisy Wheel Printer Exploration. Yet another fine, high-quality equipment autopsy brought to you courtesy of your friends at the Geek Group. Sorry to all the Italians. We'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon. All right, all right, hang on. Don't leave yet. I promised you a story, and I didn't get to tell it. So, back in like 95, 98, somewhere in there, early in the history of the Geek Group, our lab was located at 344 Ionia Street Southwest in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we had, we had this giant, old, dumpy, abandoned, condemned warehouse. It was really disgusting. And this was our first lab. One of the things we got in the warehouse a lot was giant piles of old junk computers and various forms of small furry animals that would gather together in the lower caves and groove with a pict. So one night, it's, it's the small hours, we're all hanging out late, and the guys are freaking out. They're like, Chris, Chris, there's, there's something alive down, down in the front garage. So I go down to the front garage, which we used to call the DeLorean Bay. I go down to the front garage, and there is indeed some small furry animal running around. And by small furry animal, realistically, we thought it was either a skunk or a raccoon by size. Because it looked away, you know, like 10, 12 pounds. I don't know. It's dark and it's off and it's like the size of a cat. Okay, it's a little bit bigger than a cat. It's very dark. Okay, there's, there's barely any lights in a room. And I reach down and I pick up a steel bar that was jabbing like this out the top of a busted printer that had been like thrown down a flight of stairs or something. I just reached down, I yanked the bar out, and I'm, I've got this big steel bar like this. And this particular steel bar had a pointed end on each end and a little nubbly bit where it like snapped into a thing, right? So I'm standing in a room about the size of this studio, and a thing moves over by the wall by a pallet. And I was like, that's it. They're like, yep, yep, that's it. And I'm holding this bar, and it's the middle of the night, and I'm just pissed off. And I learned a very valuable lesson that night. I'm holding this bar and a thing moves and I go, Rah! and I chuck it and I just whip the bar like, like, you'd, like, like a throwing knife, right? And I just, whoosh, just as hard as I could. And it goes, Bleh! so we all run, get flashlights, come back, and all the flashlights go in there and there's a pallet just a regular wooden shipping pallet. And jabbed through the pallet boom, is my stainless steel bar that I yanked out of a printer. And between the pallet and the wall, because the pallet's like leaning up against the wall, right? And, boom, and this goes all the way back and hits the, the brick wall. Right here, dead skunk. And it was really obvious that I killed it when I did the thing. But what you do in that moment, and you will have these moments in your life, the important thing in that moment 
is not to say, I did it. It's to just be cool and be like, yep, just walk it off. Just, just play it off, be totally cool, and you build your legendary status. But if you go, whoa, that worked, then you're just as big a dork as everybody else. And then the whole world will know your secret that in the middle of the night, when you grabbed the bar off the printer and you flung it across and you killed the skunk, you weren't cool, you weren't awesome, you were just a nerd like everybody else who got amazingly lucky that one time. And then, 20 years later, you'll get to tell it in a story at the end of your video. You guys have fun.